research them online, check them out on LinkedIn, their website, et cetera. Ask for a referral. So I always ask, because I still passively invest with folks, I ask for a referral. Can I have a couple names of your current investors to get a sense of what their experience has been? And if they don't give it to you, it's probably a red flag. Welcome to the Wealthy Mind podcast hosted by Alex Kalarinko and a good friend of mine, business partner Ashish Sanan. We are two immigrants who've come from humble beginnings to work in the Silicon Valley high-tech industry for many years, only to realize that we were trading our time for money on W-2 jobs in corporate America. Being laid off, downsized several times, watching our stock market portfolio lose significant value during each recession, paying high taxes was very frustrating. But we always knew there was a way out. Through a passionate belief in growth wealth mindset, we took massive action, started investing in commercial real estate and left our high-tech careers to build passive income with syndication investments. And now we help others like you to learn, grow and build life on your own terms. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Wealthy Mind Investment Show. Uh, I have another uh, guest. Uh, I have Jenny Gu. Uh, she is a managing partner of Vent- Vertical Street uh, Ventures. Uh, she is based in Orange County. She's been investing in real estate for many years as an active and passive investor. And she had a very long career in the corporate world. And we have an interesting topic today. We're, we're going to talk about a uh, real estate fund. Uh, many people are familiar with uh, investing in a single asset syndication, but today we're going to focus on educating you as a passive investor about what real estate fund is all about. Well, welcome uh, to the show, Jenny. Please introduce yourself and tell us how the heck did you get started with the real estate uh, investing in private equity? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, thank you, Alex, for having me on the show. We've chatted many times before, so honored to be here on the podcast. Uh, but a little bit more about me. I actually uh, am a recovering sales director, I'll say. So prior to my life <laughs> in real estate, I worked as a sales director for a company called Procter & Gamble um, and so led a corporate successful corporate career. Um, my husband and I decided to jump into real estate because we both worked for the company and we both had all of our retirement in one place. And so we just happened to meet the right person at the right time, got into single family investments, long-term single family rentals first. And then once we accumulated our 10th property, we said, okay, light bulb moment. Let's learn about how we can scale bigger, faster. Go to the next level. You got it. Yeah. And that's when we started learning about multifamily. And I believed in the model so much. So I actually quit my job at PNG in early 2020 before purchasing a single multifamily door, which is quite backwards. I look at a lot of people. You probably should plan that more thoroughly, but It just made sense for us at that time. And then that was early 2020. And then fast forward to now, we've uh, founded Vertical Tree Ventures and have about 350 million of assets under management today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, congratulations on on your success. And as my business partner, Ashish Sanan says, you know, fortune favors the brave. Uh, You took a lot of action and, uh, you know, sometimes you do get cold feet, especially leaving a corporate yeah. job that you had a lot of perks and, and benefits and high salary. But at one point, you were probably dissatisfied uh, with the direction you were going, you know, corporate politics, this and that. W- what was your why? I'm, I'm just curious. And uh, listeners probably would like to know because a lot of people are, uh, are are working in a corporate world for a long time and they're happy. Yeah. And, and you know, once we figured out our why, our decisions became so much clearer and easier. And for us, it was just family. We moved back to SoCal from the Midwest after 11 years because we needed to be closer to family. And, um, you know, at our two busy, fast paced, high stress corporate jobs, we just weren't spending enough time the way we wanted to with our family. And so we made the choice to say one of us would leave and it happened to be me to leave a good paying job with be, you know, great benefits. And I, I left on good terms and I, I love my team there at PNG, but I was just, you know, happier leaving to do my own thing and go to the kids PTA meetings and go volunteer in their classes whenever I wanted without feeling the guilt on either direction. So my, and our why is family, and it could be traveling for you. It could be 
starting a business. It could be doing more community service. Once you figure that out, then your decisions become actually easier. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot easier, but it, but it's not a, a a very easy decision to make, right? You mm-hmm. know, going back, I remember I had a lot of setbacks. I had a lot of doubts, but these are self doubts, right? You're just doubting yourself because you know we all know that real estate is a great vehicle uh, to build wealth. Ninety percent of millionaires, you know, credit mm-hmm. their real estate for the wealth. So this is a tried and true and proven vehicle to build wealth. But a lot of times, it's just those fears and mindset and old beliefs that are trying to hold you back but at one point you're able to overcome that and look where you are now (laughs) yeah and I would agree it's um I like that phrase fortune favors the brave and you know when I left my job it was right at the beginning of COVID shutdown so March 2020 I had just left my job at PNG and in California those of you who live in California know everything shut down everything was shut down The market, no one was buying, no one was selling, no one was lending. And so it was a very interesting year as I left one part of my life and then started this new part. And then also was homeschooling two kids now because they were sent home from school. Um, So it was a a very interesting year. Yes. uh, In fact, you know, we started uh, the company also uh, in 2019. And our first deal was during COVID. Everybody was scared. The stock market tanked, uh, as uh, some of us uh, remember, about 40%. A lot of people were uneasy. Some people thought probably the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in retrospect, it was scary. Nobody knew what the heck uh, w- w- was going on. But, uh, but at one point, you probably had the same feeling that, you know, things will eventually will uh, uh, be back to normal. This is not something that will, uh, 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 this is not how it's going to end. <laughs> Right. And that was a great time to buy real estate. All of the deals that were bought during those times because of the such low interest rates, right? Mm-hmm. The interest rates were so low. They're doing phenomenal. And they've had, you know, you probably had the same uh, experience as we did. Yeah. And, you know, once the, the gates opened, it it flooded out, as you remember, in 2020 and into 2021. So, yeah, we bought fantastic deals um, during those 18 to 24 months. And I would say, you know, it's all about the mindset. So you have a choice, you know, COVID, nobody knew what COVID was going to do. And I'm so so glad we're past that now. But at that moment, you can either, you know, just get sucked into the negativity and the doom and gloom and, you know, choose a, a more negative route. Or, you know, I try to think, okay, well, now I have a different day planned out versus what I had pictured in my mind of, of what retirement looked like. Um, and then choose to learn as fast as I could so that I knew when the market did eventually open up, I was ready to go. And that's, you know, I found a mentor. I, you know, worked at night when the kids were in bed on the weekends with him. And, you know, ultimately it just, it all worked out. Perfect. That's good. Maybe if we can go back for a moment and then we'll switch gears toward the fund uh, is, uh, w- w- what was your journey in terms of once you decide, you know what, I'm out of here, you know, I cannot do this anymore, I quit. In, our, in my case, I've I, I been investing for many years, uh, five plus years as a passive investor. In fact, I launched the business part-time working in my corporate job. I was a remote employee uh, for many years, and I did this uh, for close to a year until I quit, uh, until I build enough income and really confident in myself that I can do this and help others uh, invest as well. But what what was your sort of aha moment? And maybe we, if you can go back a few years and rewind the tape and tell us a little bit more. Were you part-time uh, uh, investor? Were you, in addition to a single family, did you do commercial also on part-time basis? Did you try it out? And then you said, okay, I, I'm I'm done. No. So when we uh, were doing the single family side of the business first, that was that was technically on the side part time while we were working okay. full time with our W2s. So single families. It wasn't until I left PNG that I dove 100 percent into commercial and specifically multifamily. Um, and that's again, we had spent so much time learning, listening to podcasts, reading books, going to meetups that we believed in the model to the point where we felt comfortable one of us leaving to pursue it full time. And there's a cost benefit analysis you have to do. I can start learning, but then only dedicate, you know, 25 to 50% of my time 
or I can leave one thing and go head first hundred percent so that I can ramp up faster. And that's the route that we decided to take. No, the, the, this is great. There is no right and wrong. Yeah. And it's not an easy decision again, especially in your, you know, your middle thirties, forties, you have a successful career. You yeah. have your spouse, you definitely need to be on board, you know, with the decision because you know, let's face it, you have responsibilities, you have bills to pay, you have schools, you have uh, mortgages and all of those uh, things. But uh, uh, like I said, you know, fortune for the brain, you took action and uh, you've proven that it does work, uh, which is great. So let's switch gears for a moment. Uh, you know, we want to educate uh, people about the fund model, right? There's a lot of uh, uh, investors that are maybe familiar with syndication, but for the most part, uh, uh, they're familiar with uh, investing in a single asset. So let's say it's an apartment building, or it could be, you know, industrial warehouse or healthcare uh, type of facility, and it's a single asset. There is a syndication. People go in. It's a pool of investors and they invest in one deal. Tell us more about the fund model. What, what, what the heck is fund model uh, uh, anyways? Yeah, great question. So you're correct. Historically, we've done our deals syndication by syndication, which is property by property. We actually did a small fund two years ago where we had two properties linked together into one syndication. So technically, that was our first fund. More recently, a lot of our investors, we survey our investors frequently, and they've said, you know what, I actually like the idea of diversifying my portfolio a little bit more across multiple properties. Can you start thinking about a fund? So in a nutshell, I would equate a, a real estate fund similar to a mutual fund in the market. So in a mutual fund, you are investing, let's make it up, 100 grand into a fund that houses multiple companies stock and assets. Okay. Um, so I would equate that to what we're doing right now. So today in a real estate fund, our fund will house multiple multifamily assets in one fund. Now, the benefit of this is one, first and foremost, the diversification. So our fund is going to focus on Arizona and Texas property. So it spans several regions across different cities that gives a diversification look for folks looking for that. Another benefit is in a fund across multiple properties, you will still only have one document to sign, one PPM, one subscription. And the fun part with taxes is you will only get one K1 versus if you were to individually invest in six properties, you're gonna have six documents, six K1, six everything, okay? Um, so that's a benefit of a fund. Um, one negative is, that uh, if people don't like funds, it's typically because they can't choose the asset themselves. You know, in a syndication by property, you can say, oh, yep, you know what? I don't like that property. I'm going to pass on this property, but I like the next one. In a fund, we are continually adding properties in. They're not going to be able to choose the fund properties that goes into it. They're just going to benefit from the overall terms and returns that we, um, we deliver based on the properties that we put in. Got it. Yeah, th th this is good explanation. You know, thank you for sharing. And then there's different kinds of funds, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some funds that are open funds. There's semi-blind funds uh, that are, I believe there's closed fund uh, uh, as well. And I, I really like your comparison to, you know, um, a, st a stock and diversification, such as mutual fund is, where for the most part, you know, you, you're very considered lucky if you pick the right winner in a stock market, if you pick the right Google. But there's a lot of stocks that, you know, do well. And then all of a sudden, uh, even Fortune 500 companies disappear, such as, you know, recent banking fiasco. So the, the fund can definitely provide diversification and a, a lot less risk. Absolutely. And just like I tell all of our investors, it's not just about the fund versus the syndication. Your due diligence time should actually be spent more on the operator and the person running the property, whoever's doing the asset management, because you know any good property could be taken down by a bad operator and vice yep. versa is true. A decent property could be phenomenal if you have the right operator. So I encourage a lot of investors to actually spend more time understanding who's running the property. Yes. Yes, I think a lot of people, you know, gravitate toward, oh, look at this uh, high IRR and projected numbers and look at uh, this location. It's going yeah. to do great. Well, any great uh, uh, property can be run down if it's not managed correctly. And we've seen some fiascos 
you know, in Houston for closures recently, uh, where, you know, if you don't spend enough time uh, managing or you don't have enough experience or you don't have the right partners uh, and you over leverage those, <laughs> those many components, Correct. Why any great asset, you know, could, could you know, could go bad. Right. And could lose, you know, significant amount of capital. I was just curious, uh, how, how did you guys pick up um, these two markets? You know, these are great markets. Uh, you know, uh, Arizona and Texas, uh, these are business uh, and landlord friendly states. Uh, why those two? What attracted you to pick those two markets? Yeah, and, and just what you said. So it's purely based on based on facts and data. So Arizona, Texas, Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, all of these states, what do they have in common? They're landlord friendly. They have growing populations. Um, job growth, not just job growth, but specifically new uh, companies expanding their distribution Ooh, centers or head second or third headquarters. Um, there's a lot of tech actually moving into Arizona. TSMC, the largest chip um, semiconductor company, Facebook, Intel, HelloFresh, like, there's so many companies moving into Arizona. Um, affordability, is there still a gap between mortgage prices versus rental prices? We want to see cities with a big gap between those two metrics. Um, affordability, I mentioned. So all of those data points is what we look at. And Arizona and Texas, of course, um, yields those. And I'm a little bit biased to Arizona only because I also grew up there. So I've seen myself the tremendous growth and still the opportunity um, in Arizona specifically. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Every time I go to Arizona, it seems like another company, the, the move in Arizona or Texas is another yeah. market. It's amazing. Uh, especially, you know, Dallas, Austin is, has been booming for a while, especially downtown area. Uh, it, it's been quite insane to see the, 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 trem the tremendous uh, uh, growth. So, so in your case, the fund uh, uh, that you typically uh, have, is it three, five, four, six assets? How many do you typically uh, plan or planning to have in your fund? Yeah, it's a, it's gonna be a $100 million fund. We hope to have between six to 10 properties across those two okay. markets. We have the first two properties under contract right now in Arizona. So we're raising for those two. Um, and so either one, we'll we'll find the properties first or we'll hit $100 million and we'll close it then. Um, but the fund, very similar model to um, what other funds have out there. We have different classes. One's a debt only class, 10% preferred annually. We have a, a debt, an equity class that is 8% preferred, but has equity upside. So very similar structure. When you look across different funds, you'll typically see very similar returns, which is why I say actually focus more on the operator versus the fund itself, because any fund you look at, they'll have very similar numbers. So the common questions in this case that many investors probably ask you is that, well, you have two assets, this is great, but I want to invest in six. Uh, do, do I want to wait until you acquire those six assets? Uh, uh, why, why should I invest now uh, versus later? Yeah, good question. So the fund will pay out for class A immediately in month two. Class B will be six months after you invest and we close on the first properties. What the what's neat about the fund is as we continue to add properties, your returns will stay the same. Your investment just gets diversified and spread out across the different assets. So it doesn't matter if you invest today or you invest a year from now, the return profile is very similar. So it you know, it benefits you to invest earlier on so that you're start making money on your money. So you start accruing uh, your your PRAF and your dividends and your, your cash flow. Uh, Correct. Uh, yeah. And is it still a, a, a typical uh, your five year hold, or you you expecting to hold maybe a little bit longer? We're saying four to six years. Four to six. Okay. Perfect. And uh, another common question that many investors uh, probably might might have is why now, right? Uh, not just because of two assets uh, in your fund, but you know we've, we've seen a little bit of a turmoil uh, in in the stock market, in the job market. Uh, uh, interest rates have gone <laughs> through the roof. There is a lot of uh, unease uh, for investors. There are some deals that are not performing well. 
uh, uh, so uh, what would you say to uh, somebody who is kind of sitting on the sidelines, maybe waiting for uh, some distressed properties, maybe some additional discounts uh, that are you know, could come to the market, but they might not? Yeah, I mean, I sell this to a lot of folks. It's a very common question. There is never a good time to time the market or predict when you should buy. I think it is all dependent on the deal and those financials. So uh, in today's environment, yes, there's been a lot of uncertainty. It's been quite the roller coaster yes. in terms of rates and um, deals available, good deals, bad deals, et cetera. We are just being very, very patient to find the right deal. Last year, we bought seven properties. This year, it's already you know end of June. These are the first two properties of the year. And so we've been very patient to make sure we're finding the right properties and being extra conservative, like I'm sure everyone is saying that they're doing. Um, and so as long as you find the numbers that work, then there's still good deals to be had. And we believe in the next six to 12 months, there's going to be even more good deals because of some of the turmoil, because of some of the, the, the folks that have been waiting to sell. Um, and then it'll be, I think, in my opinion, if I had a crystal ball, we're going to see a lot more movement in the next six months. Yeah, everybody is predicting more activities in, in, in Q4 because there are some uh, sellers yeah. there that are holding on to the life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the interest rates have gone up on the bridge loans and then uh, they're close to be expired soon. And they're probably underwater at this point on their debt payments, right? So th this will be an op opportunity to play. But this old saying goes, you know, don't wait to buy the real estate, buy real estate and wait. And if exactly. we just follow the model of diversification, right, yeah. of, you know, having a multiple uh, eggs in different baskets, then that's how you build a diversified portfolio of investing uh, uh, in different asset classes. And it's very difficult to, like you said, you know, to tighten the market. Now, it's important that you have a long-term outlook. There's a lot of investors out there especially new investors, uh, when they see some negative news in the market, they start to freak out. Oh, not all real estate is the same, right? And historically, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, commercial real estate, especially apartment investing, has been very recession resistant. It is. It's, um, it's, it's not, never, nothing is ever res recession proof, okay? So resilient or um, is probably the right word. Um, for assets and commercial, especially multifamily, um, self-storage, I've heard and have seen that has done well with also, you know, right now retail is suffering. Office has been very, very, very hard to do, but everybody like you hear needs a roof over their head. And as long as the mechanics work and the operations is high and top notch, then yes, multifamily is something that we believe is going to be doing okay, you know, over the next six to 12 months, and then much better as we get through this hump. So people forget real estate is a cycle. <laughs> so yes. we've had many, many good years, you know, over the last, you know, pre COVID years, and even the first couple of years of COVID. And now it's taking a little bit of a downturn, but it will come back up. And so people just, you know, we have short term memories, we forget so easily. It always does. Yeah. Uh, it does. You know, I, 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 I sometimes I, I, I uh, remind myself and other investors when it comes to renting. Uh, I came uh, from Ukraine 30 plus years ago, and I was renting two bedroom apartment uh, uh, in San Francisco uh, for $850. <laughs> when you tell that somebody, but that's the power of uh, the, the inflationary uh, rates. And over time, you know, the compound effect and the uh, uh, prices are, are ridiculous. This particular apartment costs 3x, maybe even 5x right now. Uh, so the rents does go up uh, over time. And so are re real estate value yeah. prices. Th th these things will uh, uh, obviously stabilize the, mor the mortgage rates are not directly impacted by Fed rates, but they, they, there is some correlation, right? And yeah. the interest rates will decrease uh, hopefully in the next six to eight months. It's a cycle. It's another yeah. cycle that will uh, uh, definitely take its toll and then eventually it will prevail and go yeah. down. Yeah, it's a long-term game. Yeah. Real yes. estate is not a get rich quick, you know, strategy. It's a long-term strategy. And so if you're Wanting to get rich quick is probably not the right. You don't. You probably need a very strong stomach if <laughs> that's your plan. 
Um, and you know, the thing I also add is all the media headlines, remember it's meant to be sensational. It's meant to grab your attention. So yes, we see some of the really negative, um, you know, like the Houston deal is very negative and then that's super unfortunate, but you never hear about the good things that people are doing with the communities and the, the positives of that. And you know, we're, we're, we are, our biggest initiative this year as a company is a residence first initiative where we're focusing on the residents and how to financially educate them to be, you know, more savvy. So they're not working three jobs and paycheck to paycheck. Right. So no one talks about that. It's always the the bad and the negative things, unfortunately. Yeah, very true. I can totally relate to that because media thrives on negative news and it spreads yeah. like spreads like a virus, like COVID. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, for, for, for example, we recently had a, a call with uh, one of our investor partners, uh, operators, and uh, the, the company is quite large. They own a hundred plus apartment buildings in the United States, and they refinanced 40 of them. And, and they returned more than $100 million back to their investors, which is a you know, humongous number. You never hear about those news that are usually picked up by investors. Everybody keeps hearing about, look what happened here. There was a distressed property. Everybody lost a, a lot of money. So I think it's important to have the right mindset and perspective and give yourself uh, enough time, right? Because when you, as a passive investor, uh, considering investing, you need to have that long time horizon perspective of five years. I tell everybody uh, when I talk to investors, if you don't have those five years that you can afford to give that investment time uh, uh, to go through that business plan, you should not be investing. Exactly. Uh, you're going to be so worried about your investment uh, that you cannot sleep well and yeah. uh, and uh, be so uh, affected by this negative news, then maybe this is not the right vehicle for you. And I'm not yeah. saying the stock market is less volatile. Yeah. As, as we saw, you could lose the entire uh, 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 savings uh, by investing, even in, in considered super safe uh, bank stocks, right? Mm -hmm. We saw Silicon Valley Bank, we saw First Republic Bank completely being wiped out. Yeah. Uh, so as we are uh, wrapping up this uh, um, uh, our conversation, Jenny, uh, as, as, as a passive investor, what are the top three things uh, uh, you mentioned that waiting on the operator? I guess what are the top three uh, top uh, questions that uh, passive investors uh, should ask uh, uh, when, while they're evaluating a potential investment? Perhaps a, a fund versus uh, a single asset uh, syndication. Sure. Yeah, I would start with um, what is their track record? Um, so I would say treat them as if you're interviewing to hire them to be on your team, a new employee. So what do you typically ask? What's your experience? What's your track record? Research them online, check them out on LinkedIn, their website, et cetera. Ask for a referral. So I always ask, because I still passively invest with folks, I ask for a referral. Can I have a couple names of your current investors to get a sense of what their experience has been? And if they don't give it to you, it's probably a red flag. Um, exactly. Yeah. And then a third thing you could ask for is a sample of their communication. So I'm big on investor communication. Uh, we try to be as descriptive and informative as possible in our newsletters. So ask them to share a sample. What is the, an example of your monthly newsletter? Can I see that? Or if they're willing to share a monthly statement of financials, what do they provide? Is it, you know, we share the whole packet, whatever we get from our PMs, we share. Um, or do they only share, you know, one page? T12 and that's it. Um, and so the more information they're willing to offer, the more transparent I feel like they are being and, and a little bit more trustworthy. Yes. And I can't emphasize this strong enough. You got to do due diligence on the operator, ask for references. Many people don't. Yeah. And you know, in our case, you know, we run background checks on the operators just to make sure that yep. uh, whoever we invest a significant amount of money, that there's no red flags. Right. Uh, uh, in talking to uh, other references, you know, visiting the properties, sometimes it's not possible because maybe you're in a different state, but you could, you know, do a little bit of Google research. You could mm -hmm. talk to other investors uh, as well. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, having you on the show and learn more about what you do, how you transitioned, and uh, uh, more information about the fund uh, model. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jenny, for your time. How can uh, 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 listeners uh, get in touch with you and learn more about your fund? Sure. Um, visit our website, verticalstreetventures.com. We do have an open fund if you guys have any questions. 
I love talking about real estate. So reach out. I uh, would love to meet you, connect, answer your questions. And we're on all social, social media platforms as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, it's always a pleasure to reconnect with you. Uh, uh, and I'll be learning more about uh, your fund as well myself. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Wealthy Mind podcast. We hope the content today filled your mind and your heart with the desire to build the life you deserve. If you haven't done so already, please do us a favor and kindly like and subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future impactful episodes. If you like what you heard and want to see more Wealthy Mind content and be notified about upcoming passive investment opportunities, please visit our website at www.wealthymindinvestments.com and join our investor club. You can also follow us on social media channels as we are on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank you for your time and happy investing.